welcome to CFC. I'm Andrea. Thanks for joining us. If you're new to CFC, we're glad you're here and we'd love to connect with you. You can fill out the connection card on the seat back in front of you or scan the QR code. After you leave the auditorium, just head over to the welcome desk at the bottom of the stairs. We have a gift for you. You're also welcome to join our newcomer lunch on August 4th. This is the last weekend to sign up. Register online. Are you ready to make your commitment to Christ a public declaration through baptism? Our next baptism class is coming up August 7th for baptisms, taking place on August 10th and 11th. A class for prospective members is coming up on August 13th. If you've been involved at CFC for at least six months and have taken the Discover CFC class, your next step is our members class. Check our website for details. Lastly, if you'd like to support the mission of CFC financially, you may do so at the offering boxes on your way out, at our website, or by using our Alexio app. Morning to you, CFC. It's so good to see you this morning. Hey, this past week, we had a doozy of a week around here. The walls were vibrating with the sound of laughter as around 230 children came to kids camp. And we had enough adults to wrangle them. And you know, the funny thing about serving is you enter it thinking that you have a heart for those that you're going to serve and you end up being ministered to yourself. So we just wanted to share with you, for those of us who were a part of it, how special our week was. Please take a look. It's time to celebrate. It's time to get it started. The party's happening. You know, it's an important thing to share the gospel and to, to set them up to, to a life of loving Jesus. And it took about 140 of us adults, volunteers, to put that on. So we just want to pause and say thank you. Thank you for spending your time in a worthy way. And you know what I loved about watching them worship is that kids really don't care who's next to them. They freely worship the Lord. And they were, they were loud, and they were wild, and it was awesome. And so what if that's our inspiration this morning? Because it's the same God that we serve. And sometimes as adults, we become a little timid because we worry about what we look like or who's going to hear or what it might be. But he's a holy God, and he's a worthy God, and he deserves to be praised fully. So would you stand with me as we enter into a time of worship? Not just a musical act, but a spiritual act, a holy act as we echo what is happening right now in the throne room, as we praise the Lord who dwells among us this morning, worthy are you, Lord. Let's 
Let's sing together, church. We know this one. A thousand generations falling down. Lord God Almighty, who was and is, and he is still yet to come. Amen. 
Amen. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Would you just take the opportunity to turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, say hello, see how everyone's doing. Good morning, church. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 5 to prepare us for the sermon today. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man had his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit, and is and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are really unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of the brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil from person from among you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Nathan. I'm a teaching pastor on staff here. And as you saw from that kids camp video, those of us that volunteered, we partied hard. My voice is yet to recover. <laughs> so we're going to squeak through this sermon together. Okay. I appreciate your grace. Um, just a heads up. This is the week of the month that we have a prayer ministry outside these double doors. So if the Lord has stirred up anything in you after service, there's a team of people right through these doors in this upstairs cafe who would love to pray with you. Would you guys join me in a word of prayer? I'm gonna create some space and just ask King Jesus to speak to you. Father, do what you want to do and say what you want to say this morning. Our ears are tuned to you, King. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Show me your closest friends, and I will show you your future. Maybe you've heard something like that throughout your life as you've just grown up, hearing all the warnings to be careful who you spend time with. Are these war warnings precedented? Is there a reason to be concerned with the community we surround ourselves with? Jim Rohn was probably the best business philosopher of the 20th century, and he said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. He's convinced that your community really shapes who you are. The American Journal of Psychiatry has also done tons and tons of studies on the effects of friendships on your health. Did you know that the lack of quality friendships in your life significantly impacts your lifespan? So much so that if you don't have, if a person doesn't have any quality friendships in their life, the risk factor to a shorter lifespan is like smoking 20 cigarettes a day. 
Nicholas Sucutris, not Sucutris, that's, that's our name. Christakis, different Nick, less handsome. <clears throat> He's a professor at Yale. He said this, noting some of these studies. Behavior change happens in friend networks. If people in your friend network quit smoking, you are more likely to quit smoking. If your friends gain weight, you are more likely to gain weight. We are drastically shaped by the people we spend time with. The Bible's been saying this for 3,000 years. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. One of my favorite Christian authors is John Mark Comer of Practicing the Way. He said, you don't need a PhD in clinical psychology to realize that we become like the people we spend time with. The odds are that you dress, vote, think, spend money like, and live like your friends. All of us do. We become like the people that we love and do life with. This is a powerful tool. Your immediate community, it's a really powerful tool. If you wanna be a really successful business entrepreneur, surround yourself with really successful business entrepreneurial type people and that'll rub off on you. If you wanna be really physically fit, surround yourself with people who care a ton about those crazy like CrossFit people, you know? Surround yourself by them and it'll influence you for the good. This sharp tool is also used for the negative. Sociologists have coined the term social contagion. When they see trends that sweep through a community, such as self-harm, suicidal ideology, gender dysphoria, that there's a negative aspect to the power of community. Have you considered that you right now are being shaped by the people you spend your life with? Have you thought about the fact that five years from now, things like your faith in Jesus or your marriage is greatly impacted by the people potentially you're sitting next to right now? If community is such a powerful tool, either for the good or for the bad, what is our responsibility with it? We're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter five, and if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to there. And Paul lays out an example of the, of the responsibility that we have to curate our community. So here's what's going on. The apostle Paul planted the church at Corinth. He preached the gospel there. People came to know Jesus. He, he taught them for a little bit and then he left. But like Pastor Bobby said last week, he cares about them like a spiritual father. He loves them deeply and intimately. And he receives some reports in this church that there's a man in their church who's sleeping with his stepmom. This is public. It's a man who's not trying to hide it. He's very comfortable with the sin. He's not trying to repent from it. It's such an issue that Paul's receiving reports about it. It's not that this man is fighting his sin. Somehow he's felt comfortable and prideful enough and has garnered enough support in his little community that his lifestyle in the church is totally acceptable. Paul says, no, it's not. <laughs> he says, the things that you're doing, even the non-Christians in your area, in the Corinthian city, they don't, they don't sleep with their stepmoms. You gotta knock this off. And so look, so many, like almost seven times through this one chapter, he calls the church to kick this man out. Verses two, three, five, seven, nine, and 11. Let this man be removed. Deliver him to Satan. Cleanse out the old leaven. Don't associate with, don't eat with. Purge the evil person. Paul sees this one person in this community and his warning to the church is, this person has the power to influence you. Get rid of them. The main idea for the Corinthian church and for you and I is this. 
Our responsibility is to curate our community. Now, Sarah did a great job reading through this text. So you already saw, there's some sensitive things in this passage. I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So what we're gonna do to dissect this idea of curating your community, I wanna ask three questions so that we're all on the same page. Who is the community that we're talking about? What does it mean to curate our community? What are we really talking about? And why should we do this? Who are we talking about? Look at verse nine. We're gonna start from the back and work our way backwards. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, but I don't mean people of the world. You'd have to go out of the world. I'm talking about people in the church. People who bear the name brother and yet are actually serving their own self. Who is this community that we're talking about here? I want to propose that the people, the community that has the most formational effect on you is that community that you share two things with, an identity and influence. Who is the community that you identify with? So the first example would be a church. If you say, I belong to Community Fellowship Church, those are my people. When you think of CFC, think of me because I identify with with that church. When you go out to your workplaces and people see your behavior, (laughs) they think of Community Fellowship Church because you identify with that community. But this could also be like, you ever met someone who's on a lacrosse team? (laughs) They're one of the lacrosse players. They really have a lot of identity in that. And then, It's the community that you share influence with. That you start to be, the the way that you parent is affected by your community. The way that you spend your money is affected by your community. So when I say church can be that community, there's a difference between belonging to the community at church and just attending. In the Bible, there's not really people who just kind of attend church. Because to attend the Christian church, you put your life on the line. And so they, they were saying, these are my people. This is who I identify with. So that's the community that we're talking about. That those people that you say, hey, I'm one of these guys. Curate that community. So Paul says, it's not non-believers. Don't, don't stop hanging out with people who don't know Jesus. If you look at Jesus' ministry, what did he do? He partied with non-Christians a lot, ate dinners at their house, hung out with them. Please, how in the world are we going to complete God's mission to the nations if we pull out of them? Have friends who don't know Jesus, please. Spend time with them. But if your community, the voices that you spend the most amount of time with, if they don't love Jesus, if they're not passionate about the things of God. I'm here today just to warn you, those people are going to influence your five years from now. Do you wanna be on fire for Jesus in in two decades? Not not just like, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but do you wanna burn with passion for the king at the end of your life? Look at who your community is right now because it's going to make a difference in the years to come. There's a challenging verse here at the end, verse 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church that you're supposed to judge? What is Paul saying here? Is he telling us, Christians, you're not judgy enough. You need to show up to church on Sunday ready to judge some people. (laughs) I don't think so. Judging means to like investigate, to get to the bottom, to discern what's going on here. I think some of the problems with judgy Christianity is that not the fact that someone's judging, but they're just doing it too quickly. Paul says, judge the church, investigate, is this person who's in my 
shared identity. Do they love Jesus? Are they gonna push me closer to the king? Investigate it. Spend months and months and weeks looking. When I meet with this person, do, do they spur me on in the Lord or do they talk about the sin that they're comfortable with? When I, when I look at their life, is it matching up with what they say they believe? Investigate. That's a big difference between saying, oh, short skirt, doesn't love Jesus. Saw a beer at dinner, must not follow Jesus. That is poor investigative work. But that doesn't mean we're not supposed to investigate. Do these people love Jesus? Are they gonna help me love the king better? There's a big difference. And yet we're called to judge in a loving way and in a caring way. Not in a sneer down my nose, I'm better than you because of the way that you dress. I heard a story once of a young man and I won't share names. Um, I'll change names, I'll make them up. Went to his pastor and he was greatly con concerned. He said, my sister Vanessa claims to be a Christian, but her and her boyfriend sleep together. They, they feel no burden to submit their sexuality to what Jesus has to say. Anytime we talk about it, they are very content doing things their way. And yet they call themselves a Christian. What do I do? The pastor met with him, shared this text with him, 1 Corinthians 5, and said, I recommend you go to your sister Vanessa and say, listen, I love you, but you're calling yourself a Christian. You're bearing the name of Christian, but you're totally unwilling to submit to him as king. These things don't match up. And for that reason, we got to limit the amount of time we spend together. That's a really hard conversation to have. We'll put a pin in that story. Paul is saying here, there's someone who bears the name of Christian, but is actually this. I think you guys have probably experienced in your life, maybe especially in a culturally religious background, people who say, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And they bear the name of brother in Christ. And yet... They don't follow or love Jesus. Do you know there's a difference between believing in God and following Jesus? The demons believe in God. They don't submit to him as king. We're not called to just believe in God. Check a box. That makes sense to me. You and I are called to die to ourselves, to give up our old life, to let everything go and follow the king of kings. Jesus doesn't want people holding on to their life, serving themselves as God and believing that he exists and that he's probably a good person. To be a brother in Christ is someone who has given everything else for the sake of following Jesus. That's what we want our community to look like. Again, don't stop spending time with non-believers, but the people that you share an identity and influence with we want this community. Hey, can you come here on a Sunday morning and not love Jesus? Please, I hope you do. Please, how else are you gonna hear the gospel? Come here every week. Can you lock arms with us and serve and be a member here and be entrenched in the identity of CFC if you don't submit to King Jesus? That's like our one thing. <laughs> we are submitted to the King. That's all that we're about. So yeah, that, the barrier to entry is to be a part of that is death. Die to yourself, submit to the king. That's what we're about. That's what we're talking about. That's who the community is. What are we talking about? What is it to curate your community? Look at verses two through five. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment. When you are assembled in the name of Jesus and my spirit is present in the power of Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. The idea is that sometimes a person 
needs to be cut off from the shared identity and influence of the community. So in this man, Paul says, hey, you you need to let this man know, hey, buddy, you refuse to submit to Jesus as king? You're not one of us, because that's what we do. I think there's two ways to really, um, to be cut something off from, from the influence and identity. There's a direct way and an indirect way. The direct way is to have a conversation with somebody. Hey, I really like you. I love you even. But I am crazy about King Jesus more than anything else. And when we get together and we spend our girls' nights together or we hang out on our boys' trips, it doesn't seem like you're crazy about Jesus. And so I need to limit the amount of time that we spend together because I want to be on fire for him at the end of my life. A direct, hard conversation. Another way is to do this more indirectly. Maybe you notice there's a group of friends that you identify with, like these are my people, this is my book club. But you, you know, the Spirit is speaking to you, they're not bolstering your faith in Jesus, they're pulling from it. Maybe, maybe you stop accepting some of the invites. Maybe you self-select out of those spheres of influence. So you can do it directly, have a conversation with somebody, or you can do it indirectly and start to curate your community by pulling yourself into different situations. Now, Paul's talking to a church and we're individuals, but we're also a church together. So did Paul just give us all permission to create some lists, come here next Sunday and says, you're out. (laughs) I kick you out of the church. No. Jesus actually gives us a process In Matthew 18, I'll put it on the screen. I'm not gonna read it. I don't think my voice will make it. But there's three steps. What do you do when someone says, I'm a part of this church. I I belong here. I share an identity with it. I share influence on it. And yet they're totally unsubmitted to King Jesus. Three steps that Jesus gives us in Matthew 18. Number one, you go to a brother one-on-one who sinned against you. Hey, man. The, the things that you talk about doing behind your wife's back, I, I gotta just, I, I have to, as a brother in Christ, address that with you. I don't think that's what someone who loves King Jesus does. If they don't listen, take a crowd of two or three people, step two, a small group of mature believers, have a little intervention. Hey, we love you. This behavior that you're doing behind your family's back doesn't match what King Jesus wants you to do. And if they still refuse to submit to King Jesus, then you involve church leadership. Bring them before the church. And then the church will decide whether they're to be removed from their community. When Paul is saying here, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, you're to deliver this man to Satan. Paul is their spiritual authority. So not everyone could just go through the Corinthian church kicking people out. Presumably, someone had met with the man then maybe a small group met with the man. Now, Paul, the apostle over the, over the church is saying, hey, you refuse to submit to King Jesus. You, that's what we're about. You have to get out of here. So if there's, if there's a gripe that you have with someone in your community group or at church, here's the process. Talk with them one-on-one. Then involve two or three other people. And then if someone is still refusing to submit to King Jesus, then you would grab an elder or a pastor. And it's a communal thing in the body of Christ. Sometimes I think when we talk about judging people in the church and having these hard conversations, like that direct kind of conversation as a negative thing, can I say that someone who wants to love Jesus, please judge me. I hate my sin. I hate when I disobey Jesus. I am so thankful when I was 17, my friend McCoby came to me and said, hey, buddy, you say you love Jesus, but you're sleeping with your girlfriend. I don't think this is God's plan for you. Thank you 
for judging my sin and determining if I'm following Jesus. I needed to hear that. I think of my friend Justice in college who said, hey, buddy, you say you love Jesus, but your internet habits don't match a follower of Jesus. Thank you. I hate my sin. Please judge me. I think of my friend Adam just this year. Hey, buddy, you say you love Jesus, but I don't see you delighting in your wife the way that you used to. Thank you. Please judge my sin. You may be thinking, oh man, I struggle with sin. Am I at risk for being kicked out of the community? Is someone gonna come to me and say, I can't come to church anymore because I'm a sinner? If you're struggling with sin, good. It is when you stop struggling that there's a problem. When you get to a place where you think, I'm good. I'm no longer burdened by my choices. I'm very comfortable here. I don't want to submit. I don't want to fight. I don't want to wage war against my flesh. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. We don't want any of that here. We fight our flesh. We're all struggling with sin. Welcome to the club. That's <laughs> what it means to be a Christian. Paul said this. Why do I do the things I don't want to do? Why can't I do the things I want to do? Galatians 5 says that you have two natures in you. Your sinful, fleshy nature and the spirit of God's spirit nature. And they're at war. Please struggle with your sin. You are welcome here. Don't ever stop struggling with your sin. Why would we do this? This is kind of a big ask to curate your community. That means maybe cutting off some friendships. It means maybe stopping some weekly or monthly rhythms for you of groups you used to attend. Potentially, it means some really hard conversations. Why would we do this? Two reasons this text gives us. Look at this, number, number one, verse five. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved. The destruction of his flesh, we're not saying let's go beat people up, (laughs) but there's a discomfort in being removed from a community. There's There's a discomfort from having a friendship ended. That young man who approached that pastor about his sister, Vanessa, and he approached her and said, hey, you're living in sin, you don't seem repentant, you don't seem like you're submitting to Jesus, well, I have to limit my time with you. Do you imagine how she took that? Not good. <laughs> Hurt her feelings. How da- Only God can judge me. How dare you tell me that? What, you think you're better than me? Blah, blah, blah. Really hurt her feelings. But Vanessa sat about it and thought about it for a couple of weeks. She thought and thought, and you know what happened? Oh my goodness, I'm not following Jesus. I want to follow him. And it was the, that conversation, as hard as it was, as uncomfortable as it was to her flesh, was the cold bucket of water to the face that woke Vanessa up. I want to follow King Jesus. You're right. I'm living it. I don't want to sin like this. I want to follow Jesus. Broke up with that relationship, started following Jesus. Reason number one, why would you do this? It could be good for somebody. You know what's a really dangerous message to hear for somebody who doesn't follow Jesus? You're good. Nothing wrong in your life. Just keep keep on keeping on. You will never go to the doctor if you don't think you're sick. You're never going to repent and and leave your life behind and throw yourself at the foot of the cross if everyone around you says, no, you're good, you're good. It could be a really good thing for someone to hear, hey, what you say about Jesus versus what you do isn't matching up. That hard message could be the best news someone hears out of your mouth this next month. Could be good for them. Number two, it's definitely good for the community. Look at this, verse six. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
I'm not a baker, <laughs> but I think leaven's a bacteria, a yeast. Those are the same thing. I don't know. When it's attached to the lump, it spreads. The whole lump will, will become leavened without exception. That's by nature how it works. This is what Paul is saying. You keep an influence like that in the community that shares identity and influence around you, and the whole lump will become leavened. Several years ago, my wife and I at a different church were trying to get integrated into the community. <clears throat> we checked out a community group. We went to this community group, young adults in our same demographic, and there was one couple that was attending there. They weren't the leaders of the group. They were just an attending couple. Um, but something that became evident over time is that this couple was more interested in talking about progressive theological social terms than they were about Jesus. They wanted to talk about there's no differences between men and women. Let's overthrow the patriarchy. Let's distrust the Bible because it, it, it produces chauvinistic ideas. We determined it wasn't a good fit for us. And down the road, this couple eventually left. He went to a really progressive seminary and now teaches doctrine out of a church full-time that the Bible's not the word of God, that morality is subjective, that you can find purpose and meaning in your own self instead of God's objective truth. But you know what the sad part is? They weren't leaders of that small group. They just attended. No one from that small group has been in church in over four years. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Don't you know that the friends that you associate with, that you share an identity with, your book clubs, your workout partners, your cohort at work, if you let them keep influencing you in ways that are gonna pull you for Jesus, it won't be good in the long run, friends. Our responsibility is to curate our community, to take seriously our walk with Jesus, Last night, I asked the Saturday night service who plays tennis. Not a single person plays tennis. Anyone here play tennis? Pennsylvania's not a tennis playing state. That's okay. That's all right. I think pickleball's taking over. That's all right. But surely you know who Serena Williams is. Serena Williams, <clears throat> arguably not just the best female tennis player of all time, arguably best tennis player of all time. Her career was so dominant. I mean, just crushed. She won her first Grand Slam, which is their championship, when she was 17. She would go on to win 23 Grand Slams, one short of the record of 24. Dominant figure. Made so many sacrifices along the way. She sacrificed, she had a vision for what her career could be. And she sacrificed friendships to get there. She sacrificed freedom to get there. She sacrificed time and money to get there because she had such a high vision. Check this out. In 2022, she quit. One short of tying the all-time record for most Grand Slam titles. And she quit. Reporters were like, you're so close. Don't you want that final title? Do you know why she did? She caught a higher vision. She, she had a burden for, she wanted to be a different type of mom and she wanted to stay home with her family because she just had such a burden and vision for those kids in her life. So much so that she was willing to sacrifice the most successful tennis career of all time for that vision. Sometimes I think when it comes to our faith and walk in Jesus, I think the text is asking us to make some sacrifices. And sometimes we don't make those sacrifices because our vision of who Jesus is isn't high enough. Maybe Jesus is just a good idea, makes you feel some good things sometimes. You love the Bible stories, but he's more than that. He's the God who came down and died on a cross to pay your sin debt 
and my sin debt so that you could have life with God. That's a vision worth sacrificing every friendship, every career path, every time, every money habit, every anything. Jesus is worth that sacrifice. Can I tell you this, friends? You won't ever out-sacrifice God. Do you know what he sacrificed for you? So I've got a couple of questions for you that I want you to reflect about before we get into worship. And we're just gonna carve out some space, sit there and pray through these. And the worship team will come up in a few minutes and lead us into worship. Are you bearing the name Christian? I'm a Christian, I believe in God. Or do you actually follow Jesus? Number two, how might you need to curate your community? What friendships or social circles do you need to evaluate? And last, how high is your vision of following Jesus? Let me pray for us and then we're gonna reflect before we worship. Spirit, have your way. Speak to your people right now, King. Amen.
Would you stand with us? I just want you. Nothing else. Sing it to him, church. Nothing else. you over anything else. You, King, you, our highest reward, our greatest treasure.
I love those lines, those words, where there is new wine, there's new power, there's new freedom, right? When we ask the Lord to do a transformation in our own lives, there's this excitement with that new freedom. Sometimes there's hesitation and maybe anticipation because we don't know what the journey's gonna look like to get us where we need to be, but that's where faith and trust come in. I just love the word freedom, right? For those of us that love and know Jesus, we have the freedom in Christ because of what he did on the cross. We claim that, we know that. But for me, I struggle with walking in that daily freedom, right? There's things that I know I need to change. And I can think about those things. I can talk to other people about those things. I can dwell on those things. But that is not the same as coming before the Lord Jesus Christ and confessing the things that I need to confess and asking him to do a work in my life. And so I pray as we think about Nathan's sermon today and maybe some of those stirrings in our hearts from the Holy Spirit of things that we really need to evaluate and maybe some of those chains of 
bondage that are keeping us from being the people that the people around us need us to be. I pray that we will just bring those things to the Lord and walk in that freedom that we know is very much ours on a daily basis. And so we are going to declare to finish out our service the things that Jesus has done because it is because of him that we can be changed. So let's declare this song together, church. You made a covenant with me, signed by the blood that still speaks. Now I'm forgiven, I'm called righteous, I'll be clean. There on the cross of Calvary, you gave it all to purchase me. You are the Savior and my God who set me free. choose to do in our lives. We thank you that we can become more and more like you every single day. God, I pray over those today that are feeling like they are, are captive to something, whatever that might be. You bring freedom to them in the name of Jesus. You bring joy to those who are mourning. 
healing to the broken. Thank you that you have the power to do that. Thank you that you have the power to just change us into new beings. We are forever grateful. In your powerful name, amen. Church, has been wonderful worshiping with you this morning. I do want to let you know there are dear, dear, dear people who are standing in the upstairs cafe that would love to pray for you. If you have a, this stirring in your heart and you need prayer this morning, they have been um, just a personal blessing to me in really hard circumstances in life. So um, they feel like prayer is their ministry, their spiritual gift. So if you could use prayer today, would you please go see my dear friends in the cafe? We love you. We hope you have a good week. In Jesus' name, go forth.